Welcome everybody to the introduction to HTTP. So we're going to begin by exploring exactly what HTTP is and how it works. And we'll also take a look at some examples of seeing HTTP in action, perhaps in ways that you normally may not have experienced. So as we discussed in the last tutorial, HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And protocols are a way that help us communicate when we have different pieces of hardware and software that perhaps don't all understand how they work, but they understand each other by way of this protocol. So some understanding of communication between us over this huge network of many connected pieces of hardware and software. So when you have different computers that uh, run all these different types of software, for example, you may be running Windows, and my server may be running a machine that actually has a Linux platform or you may be running a Mac OS computer where I have a Windows machine as a server and they need to understand each other when they communicate over this network for example the internet or the web and we're going to take a look at how these protocols actually work by understanding that the protocols that we're using we actually use more than one type of protocol over a network for example, we have the TCP IP suite, which are considered a set of protocols, really, a large number of them, that allow us to send packets over a network, such as the internet, or a local area network, or a wide area network. And when these packets are transmitted, it's done by way of packet switching, which is very different than the concept of circuit switching, which is very popular in the late 1800s to early 1900s during the advent of the telephone system, for example. And most of these protocols actually make sure that they understand each other by way of a handshake, such as with TCP IP. Whereas HTTP doesn't actually have a handshake, but it's meant to be a very simple protocol. One of the things that makes it very simple is that it's a stateless protocol. It makes it easy to scale out. And what we mean by stateless protocol is that no current request is actually considered to be a part of any previous request. So every time you send a request over HTTP, it's just seen as a brand new request. As far as HTTP is concerned, uh, it's not going to consider that this particular request may have been tied to any previous request that you may have made, even though it may be going to the same server. So when we're surfing the web, and we're going to take a look at an example right here, we're going to pretend that we are actually making a request over the web to Wikipedia server, so the Wikipedia site, and we have two clients in this diagram that outline how this request and response takes place. So the entire protocol is built on this request response model. So the client sends out a request as we discussed in the last tutorial and the server listens for the request and when it does receive it it sends back a response and then when the client gets this response back it does something with it. We have some expectations of what we want to do with the response such as in our case we want to view a web page inside of our web browser. And the request is actually very simple. The red uh, text that's underneath each of the clients in this example tells us exactly what this request looks like and that's all you really need right here these two simple lines in your request to get back this response from Wikipedia servers for example or from any web server that may be listening for HTTP requests and this is considered the header part of the request the request is actually made up of two parts on the top right corner of this diagram we have a header and followed by a body and that makes up the entire request and equally the response is also in the same format we have a header at the top and then a body that follows it and the way that we terminate or distinguish between the header and the body of the request and the response is that we have two canonical CRLF characters terminating the header from the body and what that means is that we have a, a carriage return and a line feed character which is ASCII characters 13 and 10 and they separate for us the header and the body. We use two of them to make sure that we've terminated that header. And when you're sending this request, this is the header part, get slash wikipedia slash html slash http 1.1 host en.wikipedia.org. 
so we know where the request is going and it gets to the server, the server responds to it and sends back equally a header followed by a body. So the header part is in green in our diagram here, HTTP forward slash 1.1 200 OK. So this tells us that the res the request was received OK and Wikipedia is responding and that's the header and now here's the body and the web browser would take that body and parse it out on the screen for you in a way that you can read. So in a representation that's going to be meaningful to you. We'll take a look at some verbs that are used. These are called HTTP request verbs. So for example we saw in the diagram the get verb being used and that has to be the first line of the request header and it has to be the first word of the request header as well and the verb get basically just means get the contents of a particular web page or a particular resource on this server following this location. Another example of a different request verb that's commonly used is post and that basically means we're going to supply a body along with this request and in our previous example in the last slide the diagram didn't actually show a body it was just a header but we didn't really need a body because we didn't have anything to send in the request body and the request body would normally contain things like information maybe that you typed into the text fields or drop down uh, combo boxes that you may have selected some options on a web page and then you would hit a button like a submit button and you would send that information along with your request in the body and those are considered post variables that are being sent to the server so that it can do something with that uh, information. Another common request verb is put, which just means we're going to upload a representation of the page or resource that we're supplying in this request. And head, which means that we just want to get the header part for whatever we're requesting. So when we send back, when we get back the response, the web server should only send us back the header and it should not send back the body of the response. And those are some of the more, more common ones that are used as far as HTTP request verbs are concerned. And there are a lot of other ones and we might see some of those later on in further tutorials. But for now, these are just some of the ones that you can take as a highlight. Now how is this actually all done? So when you type in uh, an address, a domain name to a website that you're trying to visit in your browser's address bar, how do you actually know which server holds the web pages for the web page that you're looking for or for the website that you're looking for? Well, this is done by way of DNS, which is the domain name system. And the domain name system is what translates for us something as simple as google.com, which we can understand pretty easily, to a number or an IP address like 74.125.113.105, which is something that the computer can understand more easily. The IP address, in as far as the IPv4 is concerned, is made up of 256 bits, and they're basically separated into 8 bits, and in dotted format, when we represent them like this, 74.125.113.105, for example, the first portion, the first eight bits of the address, which is represented by the number 105 here in the last octate, we call that the octate of the 256-bit address. And the second octate, 113, represents the next eight bits in the address, and 125 represent the next eight bits in the address, and 74. And that's the way that we get google.com into an IP address that the computer would know how to find on the network. So this address identifies for us which server we're going to be sending the request to. And that's done by looking up uh, certain records in the DNS. And some examples of these records, for example, um, you can get an A record, which is pretty much what we're concerned with as far as HTTP is concerned. And that lets us know what the IPv4 address for that host name is so that we can send the request to that IP address. And there's also an AAAA record, which is just a ridiculously long name for finding the IPv6 address of that host name. There's also a C name or a canonical name record, which is just used as an alias between host names. So for example, you can have something like 
www.google.com as a an alias for google.com so they ultimately both end up pointing to the same IP address they're not usually very common most people just use additional a records for each of their domain names and have them all point to the same IP address if that's what they're looking for because the C name requires an extra DNS lookup it's just like a recursive lookup whereby when we find the C name record we ultimately end up going back to find what its a record is and we have MX records for finding uh, a list of message transfer agents that's mainly used for things like mail servers when we're sending out mail. And there are name server lookups, uh, name server uh, records, I'm sorry, which identify the name server for this DNS zone. That's also a part of what we're concerned with as far as HTTP goes. We're going to be first finding the name server for the uh, domain name that we're looking for, and we're going to go to that parent uh, DNS zone that parent name server and we're going to figure out where its records reside in order to get to that IP address in order to send this request. There are also PTR or pointer records and they're mainly used for things like reverse DNS lookup. Instead of finding or mapping a domain name to an IP address we might want to map an IP address to a domain name and that has different purposes as well. And that just kind of gives you an idea of what DNS looks like. All right, so now we're going to see an actual example of HTTP in action. So normally the way that we would see this or the way that we would experience it, I'm gonna open up a web browser here, is through our client, our web browser, just sometimes referred to as a user agent, we're gonna type into the address bar, www.google.com, and what we get back is a web page. Now all the elements of this page that we're looking at actually had to take place over HTTP by sending a request to Google's web server and getting a response back that ended in the web browser being able to parse this actual HTML for us and produce this web page that we see on our screen. So let's take a look of behind the scenes what this request and response model actually looks like. I'm going to open a terminal here. And I'm going to sort of zoom in to focus on what we're looking at. And here is what we're doing. I'm going to use a program called Netcat to be able to see the actual request response taking place in just plain text without the way of the web browser getting in the way. And we're going to type in ncgoogle.com port 80. So the port is tells us, um, as far as the web server on the other end is concerned, it's going to tell us which port we're sending the request to when we do the actual request. And when I do this, what happens is I get to type in plain text the same request that we actually would do in the browser that the browser would do for us and it would look like this. So get forward slash HTTP 1.1. The forward slash part is just telling the web server what the path is as far as uh, on this particular host that I'm interested in. And the host, I'm going to include it here, is google.com. And then I have to press enter again to terminate the header and that sends off the request. And this is the response that I got back. This is the actual response from Google's web server. And it ends right here where the uh, canonical CRLF terminates the header from the body. And this part is the body. And as you can see, it just contains HTML that our web browser could easily parse into a more human readable format. So this particular highlighted part right here is the header. And what it contains is uh, HTTP forward slash 1.1. That tells us what version of the protocol that the web server understands. Equally, we told the web server what version of the protocol the client understands. And the 301, that's called an HTTP response status code. And it tells us exactly how the web server responded to our request. And this is a description of the status code and what it means. Moved permanently just means that we have to um, understand that the request that we made points to a location that the web server says has actually been moved to a different location. So if it's followed by a location header, then we have to follow that location header and actually point our request or send out another request that is going to point to a different location. And in our case, it's just telling us we should go here, www.google.com instead of google.com and it contains some additional information that we'll take a look at later. So we're going to go ahead and send another request. We're going to follow the location that we got back in our response. So we're going to say get forward slash HTTP 1.1 enter and then we're going to type in host. This time we're going to type in www.google.com 
and we're going to hit enter again and as you can see we get a different response back and I'm going to also highlight the uh, response header from the response body for us and I have to scroll up here to do it so this is the part where we sent our request and this is the response that we got back this is the header the part that I've highlighted on the screen for you and that shows us that again we got HTTP 1.1 version of the protocol a status code along with a description so 200 means okay this response was received and here is or this request I'm sorry was received and here is the response back and everything went smoothly as expected and here is the body part right here again it's terminated by this uh, canonical CRLF and here is the body so this is just a bunch of HTML it's a bunch of JavaScript uh, a bunch of text that the browser is going to end up parsing into something that we can actually look at on the screen and this is exactly what it looks like this is the same stuff that we're seeing on our screen right here which is sent in plain text so thank you very much for watching and this concludes another installment of our complete tutorial on the introduction to PHP for absolute beginners. In the next tutorial we'll be taking a look at HTML and CSS and how we use that in our development process with PHP and the web.